Here we are. Oh. Here you come, Alison. Hi, I'm Peter Wickham. This is Murray Island. Some folks have asked us how we live up here. We've made a short video on various aspects of our life on, on Murray. This is our very own bicycle and our main me means of uh, transport on Murray. Speaking of high technology, let's go and have a look at our power generation. Come on, Alison. Well, in the bad old days, like up to last year, we used to do all our washing by hand, taking volumes and volumes of our precious water. Some of our loving supporters saved up and gave us this wonderful machine called a generator. Uh, it now runs the washing machine down here, we'll show you in just a moment. It's a nice quiet one, a 1.4 kVA. It won't probably sound very quiet, but it's much more quiet than others. This is our solar panel that charges up our 12 volt battery. The 12 volt battery then runs all the lights in the house. We can also run our cassette player and our radio off the 12 volt. It was very simple to install. All we had was this one cable. It's got a red and a black wire and it goes onto the panel and goes straight down to the battery. We find it saves an awful lot of money on kerosene and dry cell batteries. In the wet season, when the sun changes over to the south, I simply take this off here and turn it around so it faces the other way. It's a, it's a lovely, simple system, and uh, we're really thankful for it. One thing we really love about Murray Island is the, the incredible difference in scenery between all of this, this bushland bamboo and the trees and flowers, the hill, the beach where the, where the village is, around the back of the island where all the rocks are. It's really wonderful to experience the Lord's creation and the change of scenery we, we can have just for the, for the walking of half a mile or so. It's really fantastic. Let's go and see what's up there. This is about half full now. During the wet season, of course, with the rain coming off the roof and coming down the down, down pipe, we get this filling up almost every night and overflowing. But during the dry season now, when it doesn't rain too much, it's, only, it's come down to about halfway. When it gets down to about here, we'll lose the water in the kitchen. And after that, of course, we start getting water out of the well again. Recently, the water came on in the steam water from the, up on the top of the hill. The water is quite reasonable that comes out of here. As you can see, it's quite clear, but uh, if we use it for drinking, it uh, doesn't taste really the best. It tastes a little bit tarry, and it leaves a decided ring of scum around your coffee cup, which isn't too nice. We have drunk it before, but it's usually best to boil it as well.
This is the well behind our house where we sometimes get water during the dry season. Um, let's just see if we can get some water out of it now. This well is about 40 feet deep. Quite a long way down. Hello, we're in luck. Once you've weeded the tadpoles things out of it, it's quite a quite clear water. We have this little vegetable patch over here with some native kind of spinach. So we often have a, have a, a rather difficult choice between watering our spinach and drinking the water ourselves. Actually, it grows more like a pumpkin vine. It tastes very much like silver beet. Very nutritious and quite delicious too. Over here we have our banana trees. As you can see, they're a lovely big bunch up here. I expect in a couple of weeks they'll be nice and ripe and we'll be feasting on those. There's another bunch up behind me here. And also, over here we have cassava. We don't actually eat the tops of these. I believe you can, but we, we don't. We haven't tried them yet. The right time of year you can harvest the roots and they have a tuber very much like a potato, any sweeter. Also over here we have several um, citrus trees. These were just little guys when we brought them up from Cairns. This one is a mandarin tree. One behind me here is a lemon and we have several lime trees around the place. I guess by the time we uh, come back from furlough next year these, these will be laden with fruit. I certainly hope so. make our own bread here most of the time of course because they can't bring it in um, it goes off too quickly uh, we don't have any trouble making it come up it comes up pretty good in this warm climate the kids always like to help make bread too Hi, big now. Mm, now we're going to put it away until it gets really big and we cook it the beach where's the dog yes what's the dog called oh, the beach. A little tree. Yeah. Has your tree got apples in it? Where's the apples? We'll be doing correspondence lessons with the children part of the time as well as sending them to school part of the time so that they can meet other children. Uh, James is only preschool level at the moment and he's still waiting for his correspondence lessons to arrive but he does enjoy, he does enjoy uh, 
doing a bit of drawing to send to Grandma and Grandpa in a letter, and he's reading a few books already. car. We've just been shopping. Every store has its own store. Every island has its own store and its own telephone. Over here we have the store we've just come from. We will buy our groceries to eat. And over there is the telephone which we use to telephone down south when the weather is good. It also runs on a solar panel and uh, it has a, a day's grace or so when there's cloudy weather. But apart from that it, uh, it packs up as soon as the sun stops shining. Well, let's see if we can get the stuff home. Off we go in the car. Thank you for helping, Alison. Good. Look, James, there's your bread. Look, see your little one. Look, Alison's one, that's James's one, isn't it? It came up big, didn't it? No. This is your one, isn't it? The building behind me is the house that we built specifically for translation work. In fact, we have a session going on right now, starting up with Ken Passy, one of my co-translators. There's a uh, drill, but I've got much of past on. There's a past tense, so it's just drill. Past tense? Yeah. And it means to, to droop over? Yeah. This is my friend Ken Passy. We're working on the translation of the parable of the sower together. The first thing we do is to go through a, the understanding of the passage through the exegetical helps. These helps are extremely helpful. They're a combination of many, many commentaries and uh, many years of work by learned men. As we go through those, we gain a much greater understanding of the, of the passage together. Ken's first job is to go through and give a rough translation. That means going through and telling the story as he would say it. Now obviously he makes a few mistakes, he doesn't understand some things, he puts a, a word wrong here and there, as we always do if we're telling a story. Now, I give someone like, um, or another language helper to go through and to correct some of those mistakes, give a, a more of an idea, a better understanding. Then we come back to Ken and he goes through and corrects some of their mistakes. And so gradually, bit by bit, we build up the very best picture we have of the story. When it's finally all done, we put it in for, for checking and for finally for printing. made up of three islands. Wire and Dower are very small and uninhabited. Mur itself is about five kilometres by two. All three are very hilly islands, so it doesn't seem like you are living on a very small island. There are 
about 250 people living on Murray nowadays. Many more of the islanders live in mainland centres such as Tansville. All around Murray and Wire and Dower are coral reefs and the water is very clear and there are many, many fish and sharks and turtles which make up the main diet of the islanders and us too. The children really enjoy each other's company, whether they're playing on bikes or pretending the boat is really out to sea and they're rocking on the waves. Many of the island children have become our children's cousins by the adoption system and they make good little playmates for them as well. The children will be going to primary school on Murray Island as well as doing correspondence lessons at home. Already James has been going to the Murray Island kindergarten and he has preschool correspondence lessons and of course Alison enjoys doing them too. A little tree. A little tree. Has your tree got apples in it? Where's the apples? Our children are not at all disadvantaged by living on Murray Island. In fact there are many advantages for them. The things that other children see and hear on television down south, they often see and hear in real life. There's always plenty of interesting things for them to talk about with us and things to draw when we write letters home to their grandparents. Since coming to Murray and seeing the many beautiful shells there are on the beach, we have as a family developed an interest in collecting shells. And now James and Alison have their own collections that they pick up shells for. All year round on Murray, it's warm enough to swim and the children love to splash in the shallows. But we always watch them very carefully and they learn a very healthy respect for the waves and the sharks that are always nearby. The children always like to come along with us to the store when we go to buy our basic groceries. There's very little traffic on the Murray Road, only a couple of motorbikes and the tractor which travels very slowly. The children learn to be very careful of the tractor and to listen for motorbikes, but when we go down south they will have to learn much more about traffic. Island feasts are very much a family affair and our children love to come along and sit down on the mat and eat island food and play with the other children. It's a lovely atmosphere. Our bicycle is really great for getting around and each of the children enjoys a turn at riding behind Daddy on the bike sometimes. Welcome to Kangaroo Ground and to the Australian headquarters of the Wycliffe Bible Translators. Firstly, let me introduce myself. I'm Darrell Koenig, the director of Wycliffe in Australia. Wycliffe is presently working in 41 countries of the world. 
And uh, in those 41 countries, we have uh, a total of 4,500 members. Of those 4,000 odd members, there are, there are 300 that are from Australia, and they are working in 11 countries of the world. You'll find Australian members mainly in the Pacific area and uh, in the Asia area, and of course amongst our Australian Aboriginal tribes. You may wonder what this complex at Kangaroo Ground does and how it relates to the worldwide program of Wycliffe Bible Translators. I might add at this point that uh, we have offices in other states as well, in Sydney, Brisbane, Perth, and a whole host of lay representatives helping us with our program in the other states as well. It is our job to keep these folk at the end of the line furnished with materials, information and encouragement. These lay representatives, together with fellow members, represent Wycliffe to the Christian public. Our mandate as a sending country is threefold. One, to recruit more workers for the countries in which Wycliffe is working. Two, to train and equip these folk. Three, to enlist and maintain prayer and financial support for our field workers. And to carry out this mandate takes quite a number of people. And today, I'd like to introduce you to just a few of them. All these folk are working at the Kangaroo Ground headquarters of Wycliffe, Australia. Now, you've already met the director, Daryl Koenig, who introduced this program. So here is his secretary, Marilyn O'Connor. Apart from her heavy typing load, Marilyn has to have a fair knowledge of administrative procedures. And someone else who has to know a lot about addresses, phone numbers and people is Nell Willingham, receptionist, mailing clerk and our switchboard operator. Hold on, please, just a moment. Are you there, Daryl? Mr. Um, Emerson calling for you. Are you able to take the call now? Hello, I'm Bob Linton. I look after the Ministries Department here at Kangaroo Ground. Our job is to relate to churches and let them know about the work of Bible translation and what the team are doing overseas. We go to churches and put on programs called Seminar of Mission Education. This is a program that presents the message in various ways. We use the overhead projector, audio visuals, and of course, movie films too. It's a wonderful story to tell, and there are many ways of doing it. Chicago. Bob mentioned seminars for mission education and Adrian Bryans is closely involved in developing the material for this program, as well as managing the printing operation. Our printer is Phil Mitten. These hands draw pictures and lay out artwork. While these hands lay bricks and work with timber, they belong to Fred Day and his team of builders expanding the facilities of the center and maintaining the grounds and the buildings. This new complex here is going to be the new linguistic and translation training centre containing a library, dining hall facilities, uh, lecture halls and offices. It's going to be used for training our new personnel, especially translation and literacy people. And of real interest is the possibility of training Asian students to go back to their own countries to do translation work. But now let's go back inside. Rolly Dawson heads up the finance section. As you know, every Wycliffe worker is supported by churches and individuals, and every gift is acknowledged and receipted on a computer. 
Down the other end of the building from the finance office is the media department. And this is where we're responsible mainly for uh, writing for the press, for radio work, and as you see around here, video. It's my responsibility to take charge of this department. My name, by the way, is Roy Gwither Jones. The audio studio has equipment that enables us to produce radio programs on tape and to do all other audio work related to communications. Also relating to media is the photographic section looked after by Len Wally. Len also works with video. Ed and Laurel Bentley look after the applications for membership. This work will soon, however, be moved to Sydney. Once a person becomes a field member, he is not neglected by the office. Frank Hoskins helps members arrange their furlough and listens to their problems and needs. Jeff Morrow oversees the young people's work. Young Wycliffe, we call it. Mainly meetings, camps and ministry in youth groups and tertiary institutions. Throughout the year, dozens of church ladies' groups spend a day out here. Sabina Coombe and her team host desk the visitors, arranging a program to inform them about the work. Last, but by no means least, are the many volunteers who come a day here and a day there. There are often opportunities for folk to work in this way in a variety of jobs. All this activity, of course, relates directly to Wycliffe's program in many countries in which we are working. The field operation is heavily dependent upon a strong home base. We have not been able to show you the whole work or introduce you to all the workers, but we trust that you have seen enough to show you that much of what happens out there in translation and literacy work in places like Papua New Guinea, the Philippines and Northern Australia, well, it starts right here.